Hello and welcome to another Daily Muppet. In today's video, I'm just going to cover all of the ownership news that is out there as things have really kicked off since the last video discussing the different parties that were interested and that now we'd be coming into the period in which it was time for people to put their money on the table and um, really firm up if they are intending to move forward with a bid for United and that there were multiple parties interested in doing this. So let's talk about them all one by one. I'm going to try to logically explain the different things that might be going on um, with all of them as there is complications, things like that, and also a lot of misunderstanding as to what is actually happening um, and, and what the implications are of each and every bid and purchase. So first, with regards to Qatar being the, the main one that a lot of people are, are talking about here, um, that obviously has been a big story recently. Um, as I said in the last video, it, the QSI, Qatari Sports Investment, and QIA were ruled out. They're not interested, they're not able to make a, a full takeover of United due to the connections with PSG. So then the story that's come out is essentially that it's a private investment group from Qatar that would be interested in taking over the club and making a bid and doing a buyout. And since that story first broke, there's been about uh, 20 more stories coming out from the Times, from Telegraph, from Press Association, from all sorts of different places that are giving different details and different information when it comes to specifically this, uh, this interest of Qatar, this bid and how it would work or if it would work at all. Um, the initial story was like this huge PR bluster about blowing bids out of the water. Eight billion was some number thrown around in there. Transfer war chest, all this kind of stuff, which I found a little bit amusing because it's very, very easy to say the right things to get people on your side. Um, but it's also wondering why you need to even do that prior to actually entering the bidding process. And then that was the initial story from Keegan. And then other stories came out that dialed it back quite a bit, said that um, it's the Emir of Qatar. He's looking more at four and a half billion. He's not willing to overpay. Then some other stories come out saying that they've insisted from the Times and Ziegler that they insisted they have not decided yet whether or not to make a bid. But what's clear is that there's an interest here from a what would be structured at least as a private investment group from Qatar in the club. What's unclear is if they know how it's going to work yet, if anyone knows how it's going to work yet, if they'll bid for it, how if the discussions with Rain have gone positively to where they've received encouragement or whether they've received more of um, discouragement about complications that may arise due to the connections. Nobody knows. Nobody knows any of that. There's a lot of different reports coming from all the different areas. And you can't generally rely on usual year football transfer journalists for these kinds of things because it's a whole different zone and a whole di different atmosphere. Then there was a report that they might do a minority stake as part of an international consortium. There's been so many different reports in the last three or four days on Qatar that it would make your head spin. But underneath it, the only thing we could say for sure is there's interest and it would be figuring out how they would structure it and, uh, and all of that that would make a deal possible or not. Um, the Emir of Qatar failed in a bid to buy uh, United over a decade ago. And I think that the, again, the insistence that he would pay way over the top of anyone else is not true um, based on prior evidence and based on the way that Qatar operate. Um, but the interest is there, something's there. They're in contact with Rain Group. So we'll see if and when they bid, how that is structured, and what happens. They're on the, they're on that kind of, uh, they're on the list now with other ones. Um, the thing that's been mentioned as well is that there are a, a big story came out today that there are five serious bidders. Uh, one of the stories was obviously saying one of them was Qatar. The other one wasn't was confusing because it was saying that they hadn't decided yet, but. Um, one thing I would like to clear up, if you read the stories, a lot of people have got the impression it's the Saudi group. Um, that's the other story that's come out today, but I'll get to that. I don't believe that, if you read the story correctly, I don't believe that it is implying that it's a Saudi group. Um, I believe it's, it, it states that there are five serious bidders, that there are Saudi private parties that have um, not connected to the government, that have um, 
requested access, where there's more than 20 parties who've requested access. So I believe it's qualifying them in that camp, but we'll talk about that in a minute. The five groups, as far as I've seen or understand it, are the Qatar group, Ineos, and the three U.S. groups, which is exactly what was mentioned in the last video with regards to the U.S. groups and Ineos. But um, let's move forward. We've talked about the Qatar and how that's going to work. I want to talk about this Ineos thing because there's a story today and there's a lot of, lot of misunderstanding about how this works from a financial standpoint. Um, and a lot of uh, people being concerned about things that are not really true, um, that are not really the case, okay? It's about um, that the initial story was that uh, Jim Ratcliffe was looking to J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs to advise on an offer bid for United. Then the story was that the banks were willing to bankroll him some money as a part of this bid. Now. The, the, here's where people are getting this very mixed up, and I'll try to explain it in really simple terms. It's a $5 billion purchase. There's no reason for Anios or any business or any private party to take $5 billion in cash and put it on the table. Because anyone with any sort of money understands that liquidity is key. You want to have as much money as you have so that you can invest it in multiple different assets, things like that, and that's how you make more money. That's how people who are very wealthy stay very wealthy and increase their wealth. You invest in a lot of things. You take your money and use it all over the place. Taking $5 billion in cash makes no sense. So all it's doing is saying, and it's not even $5 billion that or anything like that that's being asked for from Goldman Sachs or anything like that. The, the key note to it was that um, Ineos would be putting a lot of money down and getting some extra liquidity from, from Goldman Sachs to cover and pay for the debt at United and take it as well as potentially more. Now, that more could include stadium, that more could include um, investment in, in other activities, that more could include um, you know, anything investments in the infrastructure of the club while putting that debt in Ineos's hands not on United's books. In Enios's hands, not on United's books, okay? So the point to it is that um, rather than paying $5 billion in cash now, paying a chunk now, having a loan for other money that can then be paid off over a long period of time by Enios, not by United, where United would be run debt-free, um, have the resources be free and clear to operate the way that it should. Now, why would anyone want to do this? Simple. You buy the club, it's worth $5 billion today. You take out a loan. You have the club as an asset. You have this loan as a debt or liability. Over the next 10 years, while they're paying off this loan slowly, the club doubles in value, and your club is worth way more than the debt that you have, the business. It's just a smart business decision. It's how they buy any sort of property. If they were to go buy a, um, a large building for $100 million, they might not pay cash for it. They might take a loan on it just so that they continue to have cash. And that's just how businesses run. Um, so you always have cash for operations. You don't necessarily buy every, anything outright. A lot of people with a lot of money, when they go buy homes and things like that, they don't buy them outright. They still get a loan because it's better to have cash. It's simply a matter of, um, of, of a, a very, very, very ordinary business practice. But the important part of it is that no debt at Manchester United is still the outcome. No interest payments at Manchester United is still the outcome. Now, one could say, okay, well, he's got to pay this back, so then he's going to take dividends. But Jim Ratcliffe has specifically stated that he would not take dividends, is that he is against dividends um, coming from the club. So you have to take that in hand. That The point is it's simply a way of doing business where it's not putting Ineos at risk. They have this asset that's going to grow, Manchester United, that's going to be worth way more than, um, you know, the cash that's there. Uh, way more than, than what they owe. And it really, really doesn't matter. It's like, the, in really, really simple terms, would you rather pay $5 billion now or $5 billion over 30 years? There's no other difference to it. That's it. It's just like that. Anyone would take the second. It doesn't mean the club has any debt, is saddled with debt, or has any issues at all. It means nothing. It also opens up the line 
to uh, a lot of money in the U.S. where if they can get sponsorships and things like that, that would potentially open up funding for stadiums, infrastructure, things like that. So it needs to be very, very clear. There really is nothing wrong with this. If you just want an oil state to come in and throw a bunch of money at it, fine. But outside of that occurrence, this is an extremely normal business practice that has no negative implications for Manchester United and it's in fact very positive because it is clearing the debt. It is taking all of the debt and taking it off. The, even today, uh, I think Lester announced that their owner take, took the debt off of the club onto his own business to give the, the club more freedom and ability to spend and uh, improve its financial status. Same thing. It's a, it's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with it at all. The Glazers aren't paying it. Someone's paying it. So again, Unless you are adamant that you want state ownership, which I'm not going to get into for other reasons, um, this is a, just an extremely ordinary business practice. There's nothing weird about it at all. Um, so anyway, just explaining that. But uh, Jim Ratcliffe obviously seems very serious in moving forward with all of this. Um, so then in terms of the U.S. groups, if you take again those five, there's either two or three more U.S. groups involved, um, likely to be the ones that I mentioned prior. The other thing that the Times article says, which I which I did note in that video as well, is that those U.S. groups like with Chelsea could end up coming together. So one says, oh, the, there's no way anyone can compete. Not so. Um, the groups with HBSC and their partners, the groups with Stephen Pagliuca and his partners and the third group on their own, they have a hell of a lot of money and a lot of ability to invest. Uh, if they partner, it's not, we're not talking about Unless someone comes in and offers $10 billion and no one's doing that, all of them can compete on price. All of them can compete on price. All of them have the funds to do it. All of them have the ability to do it. And the U.S. groups involved, as far as I know, have all invested very heavily in stadiums, infrastructure, things like that, and have the ability, contacts, and such to do so. So it seems to be that there are multiple U.S. groups moving forward. Uh, with it as well. Ducker put out an article yesterday that said that, um, I quoted it, so let me find it here so I can read it exactly where he said, da, 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 da. Telegraph Sport understands several U.S. financier-led consortiums have privately provided insurances they will bid. However, given commitments to secrecy as part of the bidding process, fewer are willing to be named, but they did rule out the Ricketts, who are one of the finalists for Chelsea. It also named that it's likely that finalists for Chelsea. Well, the two other finalists for Chelsea, there's four finalists for Chelsea. One was Todd Boley and his group that won. One was the Ricketts who've been ruled out, and the other two, HBSC and Stephen Pagliuca. So it's very, very likely that there are two parties who are involved in this and are looking to bid, but I do wonder if they're going to team up or if, if some of these groups will team up through the process as is uh, absolutely possible and viable. But either way, there's so much interest and there's so many parties. It's extremely likely, ex it's becoming more and more likely by the day that Manchester United will be sold entirely. They will be sold entirely outright and the Glazer ownership will end. And that is the biggest takeaway from all of it. Um, but those are the main ones that I would that I said, the ones I covered there, Qatar, Enios, and U.S. groups. And the complications with Qatar lead me to believe that it's going to end up being one of the U.S. groups or, or Enios. That's my belief. That's my expectation. But um, again, I don't know enough about how that would all work to say nobody does because it's going to come down to Rain Group and the Glazers, and there's a hell of a lot of assumptions that get made there. Um, and nobody knows if there's complications with any of these. Um, but my expectation so far from everything I've heard that's been passed along that continues to be verified and correct is that it's more likely to be one of the U.S. groups or Ineos and that Sir Jim Ratcliffe is very serious about his bid. Um, I mentioned this in a video recently. There were some reports that came out that they were concerned about it, that he wasn't serious, that he was messing around. I put a video out saying quite the opposite, that I heard he was quite serious moving forward with it. There may have been issues with his initial talks and bids, but obviously he's serious as he's involved these banks in, uh, in, in, and such in working out how to do the funding. But again, it's time for him also to put his money where his mouth is and actually make the bid in that case. Um, and that leads me to the timeline. 
Um, there are already are bids in and under consideration as far as I understand it, but it's going to be, uh, we're now literally one week away from the soft deadline, um, which means that, which is why we're getting all this news about Qatar, it's why we're getting news about Ineos, it's why we're getting news about all of it. It's time now. And for anyone to be putting their bids in, if they haven't already, it's going to be coming up very, very shortly. So within the next seven days, we should start to hear. Now, are we going to hear about who's the leader yet? No, but it may be. There may be quite a lot that comes out between now and the um, and the and, and the seventeenth in that regard. There may be other groups that end up coming forward once the bids are actually in. Um, I don't know how the reporting might work once the seventeenth is there. If, you know, at that point they say, good, ratify your bids officially, if it's going to all start coming out publicly on what the bids were from uh, Manchester United side, maybe the case. I'm still hearing that they want to have this done, finalized before April, by mid-March, that they want to have this done and finalized so they know who they're having, it's moving forward, and everything can get done so they're prepared for um, summer and the end of the season. In terms of other parties and who might be possible, uh, obviously it was mentioned in, in the articles and in the prior video that there's some Saudi privately read, led groups and um, they are interested. I don't think they've moved forward yet. They're sort of dark horses in the race as well, as I said. They continue to be there, these private Saudi groups, um, Saudi media and Saudi telecom or something like that. And um, I don't know what kind of resources they have or where they'd be at. They were involved with Chelsea, but were also rejected at that point in time. There's a Saudi guy who, who owns a lot of horses too, and there was some worried about him with Chelsea. He may be involved. But again, I don't actually know if they have the resources to compete with these other groups or not. Um, Dubai was ruled out. I don't know where the hell that story came from. Um, one of those Twitter accounts, but they've never been moving forward and it's been ruled out by the times for for dubai to make any sort of attempt at manchester united at this point in time um obviously there could be unknown u.s groups there could be unknown uh europe groups there's one other thing i want to mention one article mentioned from from china and singapore now i think that that's a bit ill-informed with regards to china as as far as i know they've ruled out this kind of external you know investment in china but Singapore is interesting, um, and I would be interested to find out if from Singapore there's anyone teaming up or adding funds to it. I know, I don't know if I said this anywhere. I do know some of, one of the parties, at least one of the parties interested from the list above the five, um, did have conversations with people in Singapore. I don't know if I put this out publicly for something I had to keep private, so I cannot give a name, but there was conversations with people in Singapore um, last year or in January. It was at the beginning of the year with conversations with people in Singapore. So there's one article that talked about potential investment from Singapore, and I have to wonder if that's linked to one of these interested parties or on its own, or if you know, it's one that's going to add to it. But um, that's kind of the rundown of everything. I hope it explained everything pretty well. I hope it's understood where we're at. There's a lot up in the air still, a lot of unknowns. Nobody can say for sure who or what is going to be the outcome, except that it's getting more and more likely every single day that it is the end of the Glazers' ownership of United and that there's enough interest in the takeover for there to be a sale at a level of five billion or so that gives the Glazers what they want and the club is let go and either way I must insist yet again to be clear whoever buys the club from these parties Manchester United will be run in a debt-free manner and will be run very very differently and financially huge improvement from how it's been run before um, and I think that then setting up proper footballing structures within the club becomes the most important thing after that okay thank you for watching this video make sure to update as soon as i can on anything else and make sure you're on twitter and such you're following because i'm trying to retweet relevant pieces and parts and try to explain them as we go as things keep coming out all right thank you for watching make sure to like comment subscribe turn notifications on and i will see you in the next video